it's about that time, so I can make a start. Uh, somebody very gently pointed out to me that I'm um, quite happily saying good morning to folk who have managed to work out how to put a message up. Um, but there are a bunch of you out there who, uh, for various reasons, haven't quite got to that stage technologically. Uh, so good morning to you, um, and thank you for, for joining us. Uh, it's, it's good to know that there's so many folk out there. Uh, joining in with us uh, on a Sunday morning. Uh, there are no major intimations this week. Uh, reminder that uh, 7 o'clock tonight there will be the next of our Lent studies. Um, it's about oaths tonight and about eye for eye and stuff like that, so it, that could be quite interesting. Uh, and it's John Hutchison that's leading. Uh, my turn next week uh, when I have um, Loving Your Neighbour uh, and uh, there was something else. Yes. And giving to others. Uh, yeah. It, it's always good to have a wee look at the passage just to see what's, what the story is. Uh, struggling with the volume. Mm. Okay. Uh, <coughs> I am talking quite softly, uh, so maybe I need to up them, up my volume a little bit and, and, and say a little bit, uh, talk a bit louder. Um, the first hymn is uh, number 555. It's Amazing Grace uh, to the uh, traditional tune. Amazing Grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear! The hour I first believed Through many dangers, toils and snares I have already come Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Let's pray. Gracious God, on this day of thanksgiving, we catch a glimpse through a mother's love for her child of your love for us, the care, dedication and devotion you show to all your children. As a mother nurtures her children, instructing, feeding, clothing, guiding, so you nurture us, carefully leading us towards maturity. As a mother tends her children, comforting in times of distress, reassuring in times of uncertainty, 
encouraging in times of challenge, nursing in times of illness, so you tend us. Always there to lift us up and set us on our feet again when we fall. As a mother protects her children, watching over them every day, alert to danger, keeping them from harm, and ready if necessary to sacrifice herself for their sakes, so you protect us, your arms constantly encircling us, your hand delivering us from evil. Gracious God, we rejoice today in the wonder of your love and the constancy of your care. Gratefully, we respond in joyful worship and heartfelt thanksgiving. For the intensity of your love, we praise you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The lectionary reading in the Old Testament for today comes from the Old Testament book of Numbers, uh, chapter 21, reading verses 4 to 9. They travelled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go round Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way, and they spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. And then anyone who was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake lived. Our New Testament lesson is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath, but because of the great love for us, God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus, in order that the coming ages and he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance to do. Today is another one of those Sundays where more than one topic presents itself to the preacher. The Grace of God and Mothering Sunday, and I'll have a brief look at each one in turn. From, from earliest times, the Church has had to try and work out what it believes and why. There has to be some kind of orthodoxy, something that everyone can be ag agreeing that uh, are fundamentals to our faith. The alternative was for anything to be acceptable, and some of the biggest fights and struggles have been where the church has strayed, or has been seen as straying from what was found in Scripture. Scripture itself was the subject of much debate in the early centuries of the church, and it wasn't until the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD that much of the New Testament as we know it was agreed, and even then, there was debate about the merits of some of those books that read, led right up into the, the Reformation. The Church, it seems, liked a good argument from time to time, but for them the stakes were high, literal stakes, with martyrs aplenty. 
it was uh, the Reformation that saw a lot of that that happening particularly. Uh, in fact, I, I remember um, when we looked at the Reformation of Switzerland with Calvin and Zwingli and one or two others, um, the treatment of the Baptists was really quite inexcusable. Um, they they went for full immersion, of course, and uh, if you wanted to go that road, uh, they, the, the way of dealing with you was to drown you. Uh, and I ended up uh, walking home with a Baptist and I asked him how he was getting on with New College and he said that he was keeping his head above water. Uh, but it was the Reformation that gifted us uh, certain little Latin phrases uh, like sola scriptura, but by scripture alone, or sola fide, by faith alone, sola gratia, by grace alone, sola Christus, by Christ alone, sola soli deo gloria, glory to God alone. It's always alone. This is really important. Uh, and that, that these were principles to die for. The one that pops up today is sola gratia, by grace alone. But what is grace? According to dictionary definitions, grace can be smoothness or elegance of movement. It can be courteous goodwill. It can be a period officially allowed for payment of a sum due or for compliance with a law or condition especially an extended period period granted uh, as a special favour. But in our thinking today, the church definition is the free and unmerited favour of God as manifested in the salvation of sinners and the bestowal of blessings. That's what grace is. And Paul talks a lot about grace. Twice in the morning reading, Paul says that it is by grace you have been saved. In Romans 5 verses 1 and 2 he writes, therefore since we have been justified through faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Just think about that. We're in that place of grace as believers now. Someone once wrote that grace was God's riches at Christ's expense. Making our way through Lent towards the cross and beyond, part of that journey is recognising where we stand before God. Often the Lenten journey begins recognising that we are frail preachers prone to messing things up. In our relationship with God, which we considered last week as a priority in our spirituality, we mess things up when we make mistakes, when we sin. It's such an old word that these days people think of it as so old-fashioned as to be either laughable or even irrelevant. We're back to the caricature of the, the, the man with the sandwich board with the end is nigh and the wages of sin is death, worn by the religious crackpot, not to be taken seriously. But the trouble is that the Bible does take it seriously, extremely seriously, so much so that God has a hand in setting things right. Following laws and rules sounds like a fairly straightforward thing to do, but there is virtually nobody who has been able to obey all the laws. One of the problems the church has is that there is so much law that they become legalistic. And in the Kirk, it's fair to say that we love our law. It's why our church is based on legal courts, the session, the presbytery, the general assembly, all legal courts, each one ascending in order of authority. The thing is that with grace, some will argue that the law no longer applies. We are not so much above the law, but beyond the law, because God has dealt with our sin so it no longer matters. But neither position you'll find in Scripture. A cursory look through the Sermon of the Mount will show you that we still need to follow the legal requirements, but in such a way as to go beyond the principles to the spirit of the law too. This is why people like Nicodemus struggled with this kind of thinking. He took things literally. 
while Jesus was going beyond that to something much, much harder. But the wonder of our relationship with God in Christ is the grace in which we now stand, as Paul put it. We know that because of that fact, when we mess up, as mess up we will, the arms of God are there to pick us up, to give us a hug and put us back on our feet, to put our feet on the ground for us to try again. It's a bit like riding a bike. We've all, we all have to keep pedaling or we'll fall off. And we may fall off while pedaling because we steer off in odd directions. But God's watching us and his sense of pride in us is there when we succeed. And we can feel that. Remember Eric Liddell's famous comment about being able to feel God's pleasure when he ran. When we are connected with God through grace, we can have that same sense of knowing God's pleasure when we get it right. We can also know his forgiveness, his hug of encouragement when we mess up. That's part of what grace is. The early, earlier definitions of grace might help us to understand it too. For to have such a relationship with God is an elegant thing. It can lead us to where we can be courteous and have a sense of goodwill towards others. We can extend to people that grace period, a place of second chances, for we need those things too. There's an old phrase, there but for the grace of God go I, a recognition of God's involvement in our lives a reason to be thankful along the journey of Lent. The next hymn was uh, chosen a long, long time ago by a great philosopher called Karl Barth. He was asked to summarize the gospel in, in easy phrases, and he just started to sing this next one, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. It's number 564 in your head books. <laughs> Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, this I know. He loved children long ago. He can always make me glad, even when I'm feeling sad. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he will stay close beside me all the way. He will always be my friend, and his love will never end. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Our Gospel reading today comes from John chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. Jesus was talking to Nicodemus and he said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 
For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Mother's Day. For many people, this is rightly a day of celebration and of remembering. A lot of us, probably the majority, will have fond memories of being looked after when we grew up. In my case, and for many, it was my mum that made sure that I was ready for school and took me there until I could go myself, encouraged me to do my homework, which I mostly did, provided the meals, the clothes, the pocket money until I could earn some for myself, the disciplinarian, especially when my dad was away overseas, and the provider of a safe haven where I could always return after a long day. And that may well be the familiar picture of many, but I'm also aware that for some, this is not a day of rejoicing. For some, they were never blessed with children. For some, their mother was not there, or if there was a mother's presence, it was not the one I described through my own experience. To think of their mother for some is a sad reminder of things, of failed expectations or of dashed hopes. So what of those people today? I would gently say to them that their history need not define who they are today. People without their own family often find ways to help the wider family of the church or their relatives. With a love to give, some have gone down the road of fostering, reaching children who would otherwise run the gauntlet of a sometimes uncaring system. Being that aunt who is the one with the good advice, the one with the gentle faith, the one who offers a place to talk, who offers a listening ear, who offers a safe place, that can be a ministry in its own right. For those of us who have good memories, we can try to emulate them. I, I caught a YouTube presentation uh, of President Obama giving the Medal of Honor to Joe Biden as his last act as president. And uh, Joe Biden had no clue that was coming. Uh, and it was moving to hear each of them speak of their parents and their mothers in particular, of the grounding that they receive in how to be a good person. A lot of what they talk of might be termed old-fashioned values, but what is so wrong with them? Originally in this country, Mother's Day was an annual visit to Mother's Church. Now, of course, more than once is a much better practice, uh, and speaking of which, um, I'm hoping uh, that we can get to the stage where we can return in person with up to 50 people on Easter Sunday. Uh, that's under negotiation at the moment, and that could change depending on what the latest missives from Holyrood happen to be. So there is hope there. I did once witness an animated conversation between a minister I was placed with and a lady who, it turned out, was looking to use the church for her daughter's wedding, use being the operative word. She claimed to be a regular attender, and the minister was pretty good at knowing who those actually were. But her, regular, her regularity was annually to turn up at the Christmas Eve service. Not quite what the church had in mind, I don't think. Mother's Day is really a day when we remember those who have given us the grounding principles in life. For some of us, that will be the person. Some of us, that will be the church. The same is true for Father's Day in its own way. 
Having such a day can prompt us into thinking about what it is that drives us. What is it that motivates us? And about where that grounding comes from. Where do those grounding principles come from? And what actually are those principles? Compassion, love, family, community. I'm sure you can think of many, many others. Things that because, because of lockdown, we might find ourselves valuing even more. Give thanks today for mothers, for all that they impart, for all that they share, for those people who have stepped in for us and fulfilled that role. And remember too, those folks for whom today is really hard. Now, thinking of days that are really hard, it won't have ex escaped your attention that 25 years ago, I think yesterday, something really dreadful happened in Dunblane. I was fortunate in that I had somebody in my congregation in Leslie who was a relative of those there. Now, you might say, why am I saying fortunate? Well, it gave me a sense of understanding about the, the scale of the loss. And that was a privilege. And today across Scotland, I have been asked, and we have been asked as ministers, to say a prayer related to that anniversary. I don't know if any of you saw Lorraine Kelly's very powerful documentary about 25 years on and meeting up with people who'd never spoken about the event since then, opening up to her uh, and the fact that she wanted to give people hugs but couldn't. Uh, and that was perfectly understandable. But this is the prayer we've been asked to share in. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, yourself once a child, vulnerable and at risk. In silence we pray when words are not enough to capture the depths within. Or simply an intrusion into that place within us where quietness should dwell. Within these walls that have rung with the laughter and songs of children and witnessed the tears and heartbroken prayers of adults we remember and we pray. We remember all those who will forever remain as children in our hearts. We remember a teacher whose greatest instinct was to protect those entrusted to her care. We remember the parents, the siblings, the grandparents, the friends who will always mourn. We remember all who bear scars to this very day. As the fragile snowdrop breaks through the cold winter earth and somehow endures the elements that buffet it, we give thanks for the resilience of many and for the determination arising out of tragedy. This country should be a safer place than it used to be. We pray for children throughout the world who are denied inadequate uh, adequate food or clean water or the education or opportunity through which their gifts can develop. We pray for all children whose innocence is abused and whose spirits wither through lack of encouragement. We pray for all parents whose hearts are breaking. Christ the healer. We pray for all whose spirits are broken, whose bodies are weak or threatened by disease or whose minds are tormented. Bring healing, bring peace. We pray for those who govern, that they may always strive for justice for all and for a fairer, safer world. 
We pray for your church, that with courage, humility, imagination and faithfulness, it may follow, demonstrate the way of Christ. And we remember all those whom we love and have lost, be they young or old. Within the communion of saints, in all its variety, may they, even when out of our sight, continue to inspire us as they behold your face, God of heaven and earth. All our prayers and those too deep for any words, we offer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 132, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. <clears throat> Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the Ancient of Days, Almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, and silent as light, nor wanting, nor wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice like mountains high soaring above, Thy clouds which are fountains of goodness and love. To all life thou givest, to both great and small, In all life thou livest, the true life of all. We blossom and flourish as we leaves on the tree, and wither and perish, but not changeth thee. Great Father of glory, pure Father of light, thine angels adore thee, all veiling their sight. All praise we would render, O oh, help us to see. Tis only the splendor of light hideth thee. Go in peace to love and to serve God, and the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon you and those whom you love, both now and forever. Amen. May the God of peace go with us as we travel from this place. May the love of Jesus keep us firm in hope and full of grace. Be well, be safe. God bless.